Welcome, everybody. So, you know, at NAREP, we also care about your health and your neck. So we went from the tallest to the shortest member, just so that you could get a little, you know, some of those neck massages and kind of, you know, get ready for this. So as you all know, I am very passionate about wealth building. I made that as a cornerstone of my presidency while I was at NAREP. Um, and I have made it uh, one of those things that I want to make sure that we, as NAREP, provide a legacy to the Hispanic community on how to truly close that wealth gap in our community. You know, I was actually bragging about you guys a little bit earlier at the room because I was telling our esteemed panel here that at NAREP, we have been having these wealth conversations for a while. And we were able to see that by having those conversations and getting comfortable with that, we created an amazing change on where we were and where we are. So today we have a very, very distinct panel, and it's also very different. Just like HWP, where we have our three points on how we want to create wealth for you guys, these panelists are all here to talk about that. So the first principle that we have is creating wealth through real estate. Yannicka, I, I want to talk to you about that because we've all heard the stats and we love the stats that in the next 20 years, 70% of the new home buyers are going to be Hispanic. And that's fantastic. We're ready to buy. We've heard so many times today that we not only, you know, have the appetite, uh, we, we see the benefit and we just, but there's so many barriers. And unless we do something about these barriers, we are not going to be able to accomplish that dream of home ownership. Can you talk to me a little bit more about that? Yes, thank you so much. And um, yeah, Urban Institute um, did some research a few years ago. We looked into the future and we saw that the future of home ownership was Latino. Um, and this had a lot to do with the demographics of the population. I can give some over um, arching numbers here. And we have a lot of numbers at the Urban Institute, but this is such an incredible resource. And I just love it every year when this report comes out. We learn so much from it too. So this is definitely a, a, a shared effort to get these, the right stats and figures out. But what you have going on right now in this country is that uh, white population as a whole is aging and, and, and they're uh, generally much older than the other population. So they've already kind of on average attained a much higher rate of home ownership because your home ownership your likelihood of owning a home goes up as you age. So there's a high rate of home ownership along a, uh, along a large cohort of older white households, and as these households age out of home ownership, the white home ownership rate is actually expected to decline, and moreover, the number of white home owning households will go down. Yet we still project increased number of homeowners. So this has to come from somewhere to make up not only for the lost uh, number of white homeowners, but for, you know, to add on top of that. So that's gonna come um, from the non-white population, and predominantly that's gonna be Latinos, who are, as a demographic, much younger, entering their prime home buying years. So there's a really great um, tailwind pushing, propelling that forward. I will say that um, we were pleased to look at the numbers over the pandemic, and we saw there that, um, you know, it was hard to, to guess what might have happened. You know, there was a lot of low interest rate loans available. There was also a real housing supply shortage and a lot of demand. So we found that the homeownership rate overall for the country did go up during the, that two year period and that it went up more for Latinos and for um, black households than it did for white households. All, all groups saw some increase in homeownership, but we saw that acceleration that we were projecting um, get a little boost, I think, during the pandemic, actually. That's all good news. Um, and, but this doesn't happen by itself and it doesn't get sustained all by itself. You know, it takes professionals like you all to really, I think, help identify and help knock down some of the barriers to Latino homeownership. And I also don't want to make it sound like it's one monolithic population. You Absolutely. Know, a, a lot of it's driven by the geography, the markets that people live. Um, there's a high concentration of Latino households in high cost neighborhoods, neighborhoods facing the biggest challenges around affordability. Uh, cities with um, very low housing supply, for example. So that's going to potentially be a headwind um, for some, some sectors. It's something very different, which is the lack of small dollar loans available if you're talking about um, more, more smaller communities where the house prices are lower, but it's hard to borrow. It's hard to borrow for manufactured housing if that's the, the, you know, what's affordable to you. Um, language continues to be a barrier for some uh, for some households and some sectors of the market. So it's, I think it's both a matter of understanding the, um, the, the huge potential of 
Latinos to drive the housing market, the home ownership market, but then also to break it down into the individual markets and needs. And that's where, you know, the real estate professionals are so important to help people navigate this. And, and I love how, how you're putting it, right? Like, because what she's doing, guys, is she's out there telling the story for when you go out and talk to your officials, at, you know, in your communities, for them to make the right decisions on affordable homes, building more affordable homes, creating this inventory, doing these things to be able to, it, it tells them exactly why and where the data is coming from and why we're saying that in the next 20 years, 70% of these home buyers are going to be Hispanic. That's and the, ho the homes need to, to serve the, the market too. They need to be designed to serve the market. And I would also say that while we've got to work on the supply side and we'll, talk, we'll have a chance to talk about this some more, it's very important to pay attention to the, to the demand side as well and the, and, the, and the lending rules that can help more Latino households become homeowners safely. Absolutely, and we're gonna come back to that. So moving on onto some of the other buckets of what we care about at HWP, it has to do with investment and you know uh, startups. Uh, so Martina, that's your sweet sauce, right? So let's talk about capital allocation, especially when it comes to Latinx businesses. Um, I want you also to talk about you know your work with BlackRock, how it exemplifies how Latinx fund managers are getting involved in capital allocation, and what are other examples of their successes? Sure. Well, thanks, Sarah. And uh, I love NARA because. As Latinos, we don't talk about money enough at all of our conferences, but at NAREP, they're always talking about it and the need for it and the need for capital and allocation. So I deal a lot in the pension fund industry and we also have a real estate development group, but it's a $90 trillion industry. And a lot of those dollars are coming from Latinos that work for City of Chicago employees or City of LA or City of New York that every two weeks they're contributing their dollars from their paychecks to the pension fund system. But those dollars are not being allocated for capital to those Latino communities. And that's where the connection is with, with NAREP as well, is trying to ensure that those real estate development projects in our communities are getting the institutional dollars and Latinos are getting access to the capital. So it is something that, you know, it, it's very much needed, but that's where the growth area is as well. It's educating a lot of our elected officials to focus in on some of those dollars to get the, the capital so that it can be allocated to those projects and those affordable housing projects that they are funded and that there's kind of subs subsidies there for it. So it's something that's extremely important, but just Nobody talks think. about it. So when you think about state of California, 42% of the population is Latino. So every two weeks, those dollars are going into the CalPERS pension fund. But when you look at how many of those Latino real estate funds are actually managing the assets, it's about one-tenth of 1%. 1 so not even like a penny of every dollar, it's a tenth of a penny of every dollar. But that's where folks kind of in this room can tap into some of those uh, capital dollars for some of those projects, whether they're apartments uh, or even kind of office and other real estate projects. We know our communities, we know that folks are growing and they're, they're bringing retail as well. So there are great opportunities out there. So it's tapping into it. And I think going back to the point of BlackRock, BlackRock is probably the largest institutional company in the world. They have about $10 trillion. So they saw this opportunity that Latinos and Latino developers and black developers don't have access to capital and the equity checks. So they started up a fund to fund those black and Latino uh, developers where their checks, they're looking to allocate 20 to 50 million in some of those underserved communities that are gonna be impactful. And we've worked closely with BlackRock for the last probably 12 years or so and we're helping them find deals around the country that they can go out there and fund. They're not looking to be the majority, they're looking to be the minority, but they wanna help facilitate those development projects, especially if it's focused on impact. They are, are allocating those dollars and not just to real estate development, but also to Latino companies. And when a company like BlackRock leans in, and to give an example, they funded a Latino company right before the pandemic. The pandemic hit and JP Morgan, B of A, and some of the other big 
firms, they pulled their lines of credit to that Latino firm. So they let BlackRock know they're an investor. So BlackRock is the biggest company in the world. And they all trade with JP Morgan, B of A, and the others. So BlackRock reached out to those banks. They told them, you're going to reinstate those lines of credits, and you're going to increase the lines of credit because of it. And that really helped out that Latino company get through the pandemic, but also thrive in a very challenging time for them. So those opportunities are out there. And it's really about folks looking at different deals. And we're out there looking at different developers. There's a Latina developer in California as well that had some smaller projects that we're looking to bundle her projects to go to uh, BlackRock so that they can fund all four of her projects. So there's capital out there. We just have to be more focused on how we tap into some of those resources for our community. Absolutely. I mean, you guys, we talk about why our community needs, you know, the blueprint, the knowledge. There is money out there, but it's about telling those stories to make sure that hopefully when we're here next year having a conversation of how it's gone, we can talk about what we've been able to do, not only with access, you know, to affordable home ownership, but hopefully next year, hey, I'm even going to take it if it's 2%. Let's go from one tenth of 1% to 2% of the capital being allocated to, to our developments. I love that. Now, Melody, I am so excited that you're here. I'm actually, I, I'm geeking out with all my three panelists because I think that they're all so uniquely amazing to what we're trying to do for our community. Uh, Melody, in reinstit, I'm not even going to say this word because my Spanish is going to come through, reinstituting the White House Hispanic Initiative, uh, President Joe Biden expanded your office scope to focus not only on education, which is very important, but something that I'm very excited about, on equity and economic opportunity for Hispanics. What does that work look like, and what are some of the efforts underway that might be of interest to my NAR community? Gracias, Sara, and thanks to, to NAREP for inviting me. I'm really thrilled to be here because I absolutely love my job. I tell people I have the longest title, but also the funnest job in government. So <laughs> I am executive director of what President Biden has reinstituted to be the White House Initiative on Advancing Educational Equity, Excellence, and Economic Opportunity for Hispanics. And we're housed under the U.S. Department of Education. Yes, <laughs> Muchas right? gracias. Yes. <laughs> And for, for me, it's such a joy because growing up, I grew up in Chula Vista in San Diego. I know Narep has some strong San Diego ties. Yes, and any Tritons in the house? Do we have any UCSD alum? I know we had a few in, with the association. Um, it is, like, I never imagined that one day I would be able to work for one president. And now I've had the honor of serving two. I served in President Barack Obama's administration at the Labor Department and the Office of Personnel Management. And now I'm back serving after actually working on the transition team as well, uh, now here in this White House Hispanic Initiative role. And I've admired this office for years. And what was really exciting was to see how intentionally, and since I sit, did transition, I could say, even before day one, equity was really woven into this administration's work. And so with our office, I really like to share with you all so that you all know we're here as a resource. There's kind of five things that we do. So one is we have 12 policy goals that are cradle to career issues I know all of you care about. Part of that particular really weaves in the importance of economic opportunity. So everything from early childhood education and family supports to thinking about how do we better leverage federal data, but also how do we help build that generational wealth? What's needed in terms of financial literacy, economic opportunity to position the Latino community on stronger economic footing? We also have a commission, so very soon we will be able to have our first inaugural committee with 21 leaders from a number of different sectors who were selected by the president to help advise us in government, but also to serve as messengers and ambassadors and influencers out across the country, and ingles y también en español. So we are Woo! thrilled to have them joining us very soon. Stay tuned for that. Um, we also have an interagency working group, and this is a little wonky, but one of my favorite parts of the job because while people may see a lot of the public engagement work that we do, which is really critical and important, we're very focused on systemic change in the Biden-Harris administration. So Secretary Miguel Cardona, who is my boss, our leader at the Department of Education, he is one of four Latinos, a historic four Latinos leading ca uh, cabinet agencies. He sent a letter to every single federal agency asking them to designate not just a liaison to our office, but to stand up a team. 
Mm. And we've asked that every agency have team members that include the Chief Human Capital Officer, the Office of Small and Disadvantaged Business Utilization, policy staff, grant-making staff, folks in D.C., but also in the States, in Puerto Rico. And those agencies are really focused on figuring out how can they better move the equity needle for our community. And in particular, that's because President Biden has issued a number of executive orders, a number of presidential memoranda, so agencies really have to deliver. And they're really excited about this work. Um, so the interagency work group for us is just a really great opportunity. Agencies are reimagining how they engage in procurement practices. Historically, Latino, Hispanic-owned businesses, we've gotten less than 2% of all federal contracts. Mm -hmm. So we're on a mission we to change that, that under the leadership of, of SBA yeah. Administrator Isabella Casillas Guzman. So we're going to need your help with all of that important work. But we're also thinking, how do we do grant making work in a different sort of way? How do we make sure with our offices of civil rights, we're breaking down those barriers to access and engagement with our agencies? So that interagency work group is really great. Um, we also spend a lot of time supporting our Department of Education and Secretary Miguel Cardona's priorities. And for those who haven't heard Miguel Cardona speak yet, I encourage you to come to our website or check it out on YouTube. Watch him on the news. He makes a number of appearances. He is a father, an educator, and somebody who is so rooted in what's needed to address not just the equity issues of today, but the issues that have existed, disparities that have existed even pre-pandemic. Um, so it's really exciting. A few of his big priorities right now, he's really talking a lot about this vision around raise the bar, lead the world. You know, so this, he's really big on a few things that I know everybody in this room cares about. Academic recovery, mental health, boldly closing achievement gaps, recruiting and retaining a more diverse teaching profession, which we know is so critical for our Latino community, but also really leaning in meaningfully to building a more multilingual America. And this is really exciting for a lot of us who are Latinos, Latinas, and bilingual, because he often talks about how being bilingual is our superpower. And it's not just about helping English learners speak from their native language in English, but everybody should be multilingual. We have to be multilingual in this global economy. Yeah. And then the, the last piece of our work, too, that I would share is, is really public engagement. And so we are on a mission to, in English and in Spanish, make sure we're sharing all of the federal resources. There is so much happening in this administration. Um, for example, at the Department of Ed, we've canceled more student loans than any administration in history. We, through the Public Service Loan Forgiveness Program, have canceled people's student loans that paid 120 on-time payments, did their 10 years of public service jobs. Like Diana Cava, one of my friends who we've done some panels with, she had $180,000 of her student loans canceled because she's been working in the nonprofit sector, she's paid on time, and she was able to benefit from this program. So we're on a mission to make sure people know about these programs and stories like Diana's, because sometimes they think these programs might be too good to be true. And so it's stories like the Anna, stories like you, the ones that you all share that really help us make sure we're mobilizing our community to take advantage of the programs, especially programs that mean dollars for our community. And so one of the great things we did last year, Martin was a part of this in Chicago, our White House Hispanic Initiative worked with the Aspen Institute and their Latinos in Society program through a memorandum of understanding. And we went out around the country and did six White House Initiative Latino Economic Summits. We had the first lady, Dr. Jill Biden, three of our Latino cabinet secretaries out on the road, about a dozen federal agencies talking about jobs, procurement, energy, climate justice, a lot of great work that's happening. And we were able to engage people all across the country because not only were these events held in cities, but people flew across country or drove across state lines to make it to these different events. And for me, what's exciting is that, yes, we're sharing these historic federal injections of dollars, the programs and the resources. But what's really exciting to me are just those human moments of connection. And after these summits would end, people would just spend you know, minutes in, in line to chat with me and our federal colleagues because they wanted to learn more about federal opportunities, internships, jobs. They didn't know that there were people that looked like us with stories like theirs who serve as presidential appointees. Like you all could be considering, and I hope you do consider applying as presidential appointees because we've got full-time jobs, but also boards and commissions. And especially um, touching for me are like the stories with students. And one special story that will always stay with me is that after our summit in El Paso, there was a young intern who was really excited after the event, and I asked her why. And she said, I've never heard or seen so many Latinos share how our culture and our language are professional assets. 
And so we can talk about numbers. Like we've now grown our email list significantly because of all the student loan cancellation news. We can talk about the grants and new programs that are going out. But for me also, it's, it's those special stories. Like that young Latina now knows the sky's the limit. And so it's really powerful to be in a place where we can help with it. And I think that's why it's so important that we're having these conversations, you guys, because you are the trusted advisors that are actually out there impacting your communities. I remember when the PPP programs came out, a lot of the bodegas, a lot of the Spanish, uh, you know, uh, small businesses didn't know that that was for them. They thought it was for somebody else, so they didn't know what to do with it. And our people, our members were the one that actually hit out to their communities to help them get through that. So let's shift a little bit back into home ownership, especially housing affordability. Um, that, of course, remains a major stumbling block to increasing home ownership. What can be done to incentivize new construction with better lending terms, embrace manufactured housing, and maybe improve financing for existing homes? Well, that's, that's a lot, but I think your question really um, covers the thing I said before about you, got, you can't think about just supply without making sure that the people that you want to see buy the homes are in a position to get the financing to do it. You can't just think about the loans if there's no homes for them to buy. And we are sitting here uh, a deficit, I think, that's increasing now in number of total housing units, including rental and home ownership, uh, that's been building since after the foreclosure crisis. So building and, and new home starts, uh, as well as mobile home shipments, fell dramatically in 2008 and have really stayed lower over the last 15 years than they were in the half century before that on a per capita basis. So we are just looking at a, a deficit that took a long time to, to get there and it's gonna take a bit of time to dig our way out and to put more ho housing online. So there is just, you know, not letting up, not taking off any pressure, calls for local officials, all the way up to the national level. The Biden administration has a, has a, a sharp eye on housing supply and initiative around that, but we also need local level initiatives to correspond with that and capital that you describe here and local developers particularly who tend to build homes more in the affordable, uh, Price Space. point range. That's right. right. So all of that's happening. In the meantime, thinking about how do people get the financing they need. You know, over the two years of the pandemic, at the median, Latino households who owned homes saw their home values go up by 25 percent, and that's um, a lot, considering especially because most of them are not. They put down less than you know less than 20 percent to buy that home in the first place. So it's a tremendous. And I know that's not why people own homes just to get rich off of them, but it is a tremendous wealth building tool over the long term. Um, a lot of households don't know about down payment assistance programs that can help them get down for, for 5%, get into a home for 5% or less down. And this is particularly where real estate agents can become so crucial in connecting households with those kind of local resources. Um, it, there is, I can, uh, there's a, a resource called downpaymentresource.com where you can look up and see what down payment assistance programs are available in your area, downpaymentresource.com. Um, and so that's one tool that you can use to help connect folks. Um, another area in financing side that's um, particularly relevant for this market is um, alternative credit. Mm -hmm. A lot of Latinos are credit invisible, so-called, meaning they haven't really had the opportunity to build a, enough traditional lines of credit that show up on a report to get a FICO. But they're paying rent, they're paying other bills, and so there are new developing ways in which um, borrowers can get credit for on-time rental payments. It's just that you have to be connected to the opportunity to know, to ask the right questions. And so these are some areas I think where um, folks here in this room could be particularly And helpful. I think we all need to listen to that last thing that she said, and it was we all need to know to ask the right questions. I think a lot of the times we think these are such big problems, right? And there are so many intelligent people who are trying to come up with the ideas but the thing is that they're not boots on the ground. They're not practitioners. They're not behind the table or in front of the table or showing these homes. So it's very important that we have a partnership with you know, government, with other institutions, telling them the stories on how some of these things can affect the real life and what we're doing. So I think that's incredible. That and, and home buyer education is a piece of that as well. Absolutely, I think so. And I think our membership hits very hard when it comes to financial education to the consumer. But I think in this morning, one of our national board members, Nelly Soto, said that um, you know, she loves taking these back home and then she will drop them off in her municipalities to make sure that they understand our makeup and what's going on in the stories. This is not just something for us to Instagram and look pretty and we look so smart because we have these stats. 
This is powerful. These are the stories that we can come and say, hey, we need help with this. I mean, imagine, you know, here, I'm getting excited about these, these um, you know, procurement, because that means government contracts that are set aside for Latinos. I'm so excited about, you know, what you're doing and how you're pushing to make sure we have a bigger interest, because that is rerouting money for us to be able to create not only some wealth for those developers and people who want to get into it, but also some affordable housing. So let me go back to you, Martin, because I'm, I'm really excited about this. Obviously, there's some challenges that remain. So what are the remaining challenges in getting investment capital to Latino fund managers? So I think uh, the biggest part is always capital. And <clears throat> even as real estate kind of brokers or even developers, the hardest part is how do you come up with that equity capital for those projects? You can buy the land, but then you have to develop it and go through entitlements. And that's where we see a lot of folks, Latinos and others, that don't have the capital to go and build out and have the architects and the engineers to do some of the work that's out there. And even though those challenges are there, I think one of the things that we try to do is really kind of go out there and provide some of those capital dollars where we're a developer, but also we're an investor. And the one thing that helped us out is that we, would, we knew how to build the capital stack from the bond transactions for some of the, the TIF dollars, but also with some of the bonds for infrastructure and also for the city to leverage them to go out and issue bonds for the project because that project is gonna generate revenues and that will be going back to the city's coffers in tax dollars. So it is kind of uh, an area of focus where providing those equity dollars is really important and it's a topic that's being discussed. I know in the New York Times, there was an article about two weeks ago, the lack of Latino and black developers around the country. And when you think about it, it's our tax dollars that are going into the system and we're good enough to put into those pension fund dollars every two weeks but we're not good enough to man the assets so it's like a one-way street and it's not coming back and helping us to go out there and develop some of those projects and for the pension funds they're going to look at the skyscrapers and the very high-end you know residential housing but we know our markets, whether it's in Little Village in Chicago or East LA or different parts of Miami and New York and Texas, we know that there's good opportunities to invest. It's not a token minority program. This is where people can put their dollars and make good returns. And they're good kind of just like investments to make. That's where the challenge comes. That's where you have to keep pushing. And it comes from the federal side. It comes from the state side and the city and county side as well, that they're all contributing to help with those, those dollars and funding those, those gaps. Because without it, it's, it's not gonna be possible. But there's other firms that are out there that are also looking. So when we're developing, it might be a stadium, and now we're looking at a couple of venues for Latino entertainment. You see Grupo Firme, you see that, you know, Bad Bunny and all these others, they're selling out and a lot of Anglos in Chicago, they're like the bookies, <laughs> like, who are these guys? They sold out, you know, Soldier Field for, for three nights. And it's like, yeah, it's a great band. So now you're starting to see our folks that, hey, we don't want to keep renting from some of those venues. We want to build our own and we want to manage the concessions. And right. that's where it's kind of comes. So that's an important part of it that we are driving this economy. We have to make sure we're getting the capital coming back to us as well for these projects. That we're making the decisions. That we're yes. making the decisions. When you control the money, you can control the agenda. Exactly. And really quickly, because I do have one more question for Melody, but I have to, this is one of my favorite things that I found out about you. Um, because not only does he talk the talk, he walks the walk, guys. So can you tell us really quickly about your partnership from Cabrera Capital with Lee Elementary in Chicago? Sure, so we have a big uh, $450 million development with 750 units and commercial in the southwest side. But we went and adopted uh, one of the grammar schools, about 98% uh, Latino kids, but we had to do it for kids like me growing up. I didn't know anything about investments or real estate until I was a senior in high school and I learned about the stock market. But we are actually giving back to, there's about 700 kids in the grammar school, but each of them will get $100 for their 529 plans 
and then separately, each of the, the grades will get $20,000 from kindergarten through eighth grade, and they get to invest it in stocks. And they'll keep that time so that kindergarten class will invest the $20,000, and they all want to buy Roblox. And, uh, <laughs> hey, that what you know. It, it grow, and then after eighth grade, say if it grows to 120000 from 20000 they keep the profits. Half the profits go to their 529 plans, and then the other half goes to the school and gets recycled back into the kindergarten. Right? I, impressive panel, you guys. Okay, Melody, last question for you. How can government and private sector work together on economic empowerment efforts um, that you're seeing at the Department of Education and through your initiatives work? Yeah, absolutely. And hopefully you're getting great ideas like what Martin just shared. There's so much opportunity and I really encourage you to go back home and think, how might we break down some of these silos that exist in our community to really more meaningfully advance equity for, for Latinos? And from my perspective, there are some really great sort of ways that I'd love to just kind of plant some seeds in case any of those resonate with you all. First, of course, I love the MO that we were able to do with Aspen Institute. So some agencies like ours are able to do MOUs and accept gift funds. Like That's something I'd love to try to build more on because I'd love to be able to build some stronger White House Hispanic Initiative, Latino leadership programs, have more paid interns. There's also pathways where we can bring experienced professionals in to also have like a detailed assignment in government. So there's ways that we can do MOUs and gift funds to really work on different sort of strategic initiatives. Um, Secretary Cardona was just at South by Southwest also with Eva Lang Gloria and others, um, talking about another similar example to what Martin shared, where in Los Angeles, there is the Roybal Film and Television Magnet School, named after former Congressman Roybal. And the, basically, the, the Los Angeles and entertainment industry started to realize there are really lucrative careers in television and in production not just in front of camera, but also behind and in engineering. So basically the entertainment sector in particular has really invested in this high school to help generate that next generation of talent to be working, whether it's on in front of the camera or even especially behind and they're focusing on STEM and the arts and really that extra sort of investment is serving a diverse community of students there to be able to have that sort of pathway into those lucrative careers. But that's just also an example of what we're constantly advocating for more of, which is community schools. And so where you can, even at the very local level, you might not be George Clooney or Eva Longoria level yet, or maybe some of you are already at that level, but there's ways to work with your local school communities and figure out what wraparound services and supports are needed. How do we connect the local chambers of commerce and service providers to be able to deliver services for the students, for their families, and multilingual, multicultural sort of environments. There's a lot of energy and we're focusing a lot on grants and support in that space. Um, there's also some really interesting initiatives that our department and secretary are promoting, so would love to plant these seeds in case you all are interested. Um, but we're working a lot on Engage Every Student. This initiative gets to your earlier point about the importance of asking questions. So how many of you all are parents in the audience? Do we have parents? Raise your hands high. Parents, grandparents, tíos, tías. Cada uno de ustedes pueden hacer preguntas. You all can be asking your school principals, your school boards, how our federal funds are being used at the local level. If they're being used to recruit and retain Latino educators, mental health professionals, counselors, career advisors, because the money's out there. Secretary Cardona sometimes says it used to be the case at schools that we would say, oh, you know, we can't do this because we don't have money. Now, because of the pandemic, historic dollars have been injected into our states and localities. So we need your help making sure those dollars are spent the way you know your kids, your nieces, your grandchildren need that money. So there's even just your advocacy voice, which can be really valuable and critical. We also have another sort of initiative that's a cross-sector collaboration called the Partnership for Student Success. And this is in response to President Biden's call for 250,000 more caring adults to step into young people's lives. This is as could be something formal as mental health professionals, but could also be career counselors, advisors. I know all of you could be great mentors and supporters, so that's something that we're really pushing more cross-sector collaboration around. Because our students, you know, need not just academic recovery right now, but a lot of that mental health support, social emotional support, that inspiration that we know will help keep them on the right path to success. Um, and also would just really encourage you all to, you know, even some of the themes that we've been talking about here and that you'll continue to hear through NAREP and, and during your time in DC, 
take them home. Please talk about these programs. Because here in government, there are so many of us who are working to advance equity. Um, just like me, there's a whole network of other Latino appointees. At some of them you might hear from during this conference. But there are folks at so many different federal agencies who are working to advance equity. So we want you all to go home and talk about how we're trying to grow Hispanic-owned businesses' access to procurement. Like the bipartisan that. infrastructure law that we talked about has now direct hire job opportunities that I hope you all will talk about. So I if people go to usajobs.gov, it used to be that that's where you house all the federal jobs. But right now, if you go in and you click infrastructure law jobs, many of them are direct hire. If people want to come to DC, that's cool. But also, there's so many in the cities and states that we would love to make sure you're all helping us promote. So just we always know that the federal government can be a great pathway to the middle class, to building generational wealth, to buying property. And so those opportunities are out there now, and we need your help growing the representation of Hispanics because we've only been 10% of all the We have the workforce. right group for that. Thank you so much. I could spend all day talking to you guys. Unfortunately, our time is up. Thank you, guys. Um, you know, and please thank our panel. Thank you, Sarah. Thank you.